Hey, today we are taking a deep dive into the fundamental principles of investing. Now here on the Debt Free Dad podcast, as you guys know, our mission is all about empowering you to break free from the shackles of debt, paving the way for a life with less financial stress and more of what truly brings you happiness. But hey, once you've conquered that debt mountain, it's time to set your sights on the big picture, which is investing in your future. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled to have Greg and Colin from the Free Lunch Podcast joining us here today, and they're here to guide us through the investing basics, shedding some light on some common misconceptions along the way. So sit tight and get ready to level up your financial know-how. Stay tuned. Hey, hey, hey guys, welcome to today's show. I am Brad Nelson, founder of Debt Free Dad. I've paid off about $45,000 of debt, have been debt-free now for more than 11 years outside of my mortgage, and I've also helped thousands of other people save and pay off tens of millions of dollars with the work that we've done here over the years at Debt Free Dad. Now, after listening to this episode, if you are ready to take this a step further and you'd like to get better results with your finances in as little as just 30 to 60 days, we're going to be sharing some details about how you can get started in that uh, a little later on in the show. So as I mentioned, guys, I'm really excited to welcome Colin and Greg to the show today to talk about the basics of investing. I know many of our listeners have reached out over the years saying, hey, when are you guys going to talk about investing? Well, today is that day we're going to start getting into some of that. So uh, first, I'm going to introduce Colin. Colin Andrews is a portfolio manager and operates as the business leader for the CM Group. He is a dedicated believer in the long-term approach to building and protecting wealth, offering high net worth individuals and their families investment advice since 1999. When he's not in the office, Colin enjoys spending time with his wife and his children, spending time as a family getting out to the mountains in the summer and being at that cold hockey rink or basketball court uh, in the winter. Uh, Greg Kaminsky is a portfolio manager for the CM Group and has been working with individual and corporate clients to create a positive investment experience since 1996. Now, Greg's background in science has led him to an evidence-based approach to the wealth management process, which drives planning and investing decisions based on data and factual information rather than emotions and speculation. Outside of the office, Greg spends his time with his wife and children, not to mention a menagerie of his furry friends. <laughs> Greg and Colin, <laughs> welcome to the show. So glad that you guys are joining us here today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Greg and Colin were kind enough to have me on their podcast, the Free Lunch Podcast. So if uh, after listening to this, uh, obviously they'll probably point you in that direction too, but uh, they talk all about investing in there. So if you're looking to learn more, it's a great podcast to start listening to because they cover a lot of those topics uh, on that show. So guys, let's dive right into this because there's quite a bit to talk about. And uh, I think the first thing I'd, I'd really like to want to know is I'm going to pretend to be somebody who doesn't really know anything about investing. And uh, I don't claim to be an investment expert. In fact, I am not. I, anyone asks me about investment advice, it's like, I'm the wrong person to talk to. <laughs> I can help you get out of debt. You need to talk to some other professionals about when, when it comes to investing. But if I, if I was a newbie when it comes to investing, guys, uh, what are the things that I should be thinking about or considering first? Like, how do I open this door to this investment world if I know nothing about it? I think the first thing for me is figuring out just how much excess cash you have to invest would be a good place to start. Um, because a question we often get from new investors and people that have been with us a long time is, when's a good time to start investing? And the answer is, it's a good time to start investing when you have cash. Um it kind of doesn't matter when uh, during a cycle. It's just figuring out well, where, how much do you have to invest first? I think that would be the place to start, Greg. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, and, and Brad, your uh, uh, your listeners, I mean, they've been working to get out of debt. And usually that means being careful with budgets and using excess cash each month to pay down debt. Now, a lot of these people have been doing that. They've been setting aside a uh, an amount of cash to pay down their existing debt. Now that they're out of debt, they are in a habit of setting aside those amounts of money. And if you then use those amounts of money to actually invest, as opposed to paying down debt, then you're setting yourself up for the long-term future by having ideally the discipline to set aside savings for the long-term. So once I have kind of an established amount though, how do I overcome this feeling of, um, feeling dumb or stupid about this topic, you know, inadequate, maybe I've never been really taught how to do this. And and some people probably stay away. In fact, I've talked to several people over the years that stay away from the market and they don't invest because they just don't know anything about it. Yeah. I, I like to start the conversation with, look, first of all, you've established how much you can afford to invest, but I start the conversation with, 
investing is complex. It is not simple. Like what people talk about the stock market or the bond market, they talk about it very flippantly, you know, but the, the reality is most people don't really have a good understanding of what a stock market even is. And so then they get sort of overwhelmed with, okay, well, I don't really understand what the stock market is. What stock would I even buy? You know, what would I even, where would I put my money? And so Greg and I spent a lot of time with clients and, and family members of clients just going through some of the basics, you know, like what is a stock? What is a bond? How do they work? Um, you know, how if you put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, in one type of security, you're probably taking on a lot more risk than you know. A lot of this stems from, as you say, Brad, uh, people are unsure about how to approach the stock market. And I think um, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to understand all the inner workings of stocks and bonds, but you need to do a some amount of uh, self-education or, or having somebody help you with it to really understand how they work. Because one of the, you know, one of the myths of investing is that, well, it's, it's like gambling. It's, it's, it's taking a big risk and I can't afford to do that after I've spent so much time paying down debt and actually having money to invest. And, and uh, as Colin mentioned, I mean, um, you know, investing in the stock market is, it's really not like gambling. I mean, owning stocks, means owning shares of businesses, you know, that, that drive the economy and, and produce the goods and services that we all use, our, our, our phones, our, uh, our technology, et cetera. And, and so separating the perceived risk uh, of investing from the reality, I think, is, is step one. And that does require some amount of, of education. And, of course, there's lots of places uh, to learn, uh, you know, that are um, uh, different websites and things. They're dedicated to just giving people an understanding of how these things work. And as Colin mentions, the approach has to be more than just what stock do I buy? Because, uh, of course, we recommend, in fact, that there's no need for people to buy individual stocks at all. And, and so uh, looking at at ways um, to get into the markets, whether it's stock markets or bond markets, uh, it does require a little bit of a little bit of searching and uh, searching for advice, which uh, is relatively plentiful. Yeah, the problem I see is that we're surrounded by these headlines that tell us that we should be doing something, and we just don't know what to do. And yeah. so you fall prey to the headlines. You know, if uh, a market is down, and somebody might say, "Well, why would I risk any of my money right now?" You know, if a market's up. There might be this fear of missing out, like, oh, geez, I, I missed out. Well, how do I get in? And then it's, well, as Greg said, what do I actually buy? Because I can tell you, the first day I was licensed to actually work in this role, it was one of the scariest days of my life because I was newly minted, a newly minted stockbroker, as we were called back then. And I had no idea what stock I would even recommend. So how would anybody that's coming to me at that time for advice have any confidence in what to do? Right. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a very complex arena. And as Greg mentioned, there's so many places where you can get the fundamentals first, like, like what is the stock market? What is the bond market? How do they work together in regards to risk? You know, how do you diversify that risk? You know, I mean, I think that's step one. So when it comes to a typical portfolio when you guys work with individuals I'm, i know everyone's situation is probably different but is the average portfolio complicated it doesn't have to be uh, and and the, the reason for that is there's a variety of of investment vehicles that simplify it for the average investor and and you don't have to be an average investor by the way so um you know one of the things people might think is well i don't have enough money to get into the stock market don't, don't you have to have Fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars to get in, yeah. and that's just not true. You can get in with very small initial purchases, and some of the structures uh, or things that you can invest in would be mutual funds or exchange traded funds, and all of the all these funds are are baskets of securities. So rather than having to go out if you if you want to invest in the stock market, rather than going out and having to pick fifty or a hundred stocks. Um, you can just buy an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund that holds all of those stocks 
you know, all of the stocks in the index, for example, the S&P 500 index, you can buy that at a very low cost and you get instant diversification. Your, your portfolio will perform as well as the stock markets with a hundred dollar initial investment, for example. So looking for those inexpensive diversified uh, products that give you the exposure you need uh, is the, is the simplest way to approach it. So for, for newer investors that you see coming in, what are some of the misconceptions? Like uh, I know you mentioned um, Colin, like headlines, you know, what are some myths mm -hmm. or some, I guess, maybe truthiness statements that people believe that just aren't really all that true when it comes to investing. And they have these ideas because of, you know, social media and the news and what their friends and family are doing, or there might be this one person who's doing, you know, individual stocks and, you know, he's making it rich. Like, do they, do people have a lot of these misconceptions coming in? Oh, so many, so many. Um, have you ever been around a gambler? <laughs> sure. Uh, for sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. And does a gambler ever tell you about their losses or do they tell you about their wins? Only the wins. Only the wins. That's the same with uh, if you're around the, the water cooler in the office or talking to friends and family at gatherings, people typically only talk about things that maybe they bought that went up, but they don't talk about all the things that they did that didn't work out. Right. You know, and so it leaves the person in that situation feeling like, wow, that person really knows what they're doing. Like, I want to be like them. But the person that's relaying that information probably didn't really know what they were doing to begin with, you know? So, so that's a, a big misconception that I run into all the time, especially with younger people or people that are just starting out is they feel like they're, they feel like people like us are gatekeepers of information. Like, like Greg and I have some secret information that is only accessible to the ultra, ultra wealthy, you know, and we only give it to people that we work with. It's just not true. You know, I mean, in, let's just say it this way, and I'm, I'm rambling on. Investments are priced based off of all of the information that's available today. Just assume that there's no inside track that, you know, if you're buying a mutual fund or a stock or a bond or whatever, that the price today is, is, is because of what's known about it today. And nobody knows what the news will be tomorrow. So that's sort of number one, I'd say, Greg. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think uh, I'll mention another another myth, just that uh, as as Colin mentioned, that investing is like gambling. It really isn't. You know, gambling. If you're gambling in Las Vegas, for example, they say the house always wins, and and it does on average. You know, the odds of of winning at any of the uh, the games in Las Vegas is below fifty percent, and so it's not a it's not a good bet. Whereas investing is not like gambling investing as i mentioned you're you're buying shares of businesses that grow over time and and uh, and just to just to own the stock market index which we talked about the S&P 500 index which is the 500 largest stocks that trade in the united states just by owning that index you'd have exposure to apple nvidia tesla all of the names that you're hearing plus hundreds of other names that you don't hear about but are great businesses and I think, and and I think, uh, one of the other myths that that is uh, uh, is uh, can be devastating for people wanting to get in, and is just that whole thought that I can wait for the best time to get into the market. Like today, the markets are too high, and it's too late. I've missed it, or the markets are too low, and and they're dropping, and and I, you know, why would I put money into something that's going down every day? And so this concept of being able to time the best time to get into the market um, is really a, a bit of a fallacy uh, because it's pretty much impossible. And, and so what happens is if you're a new investor, uh, one of the best ways you can invest is through something we call dollar cost averaging. And all that means is buying a fixed amount of investments, call it stocks for now, uh, through a low cost fund and just putting that money in every month uh, if it's a hundred, if it's a hundred dollars a month, you can afford. Then put in a hundred dollars a month into the investments and just buy it every month. Because the thing that most people don't understand is that when you're a buyer of stocks, you actually hope that the stock market goes down. Right. So whereas when most people wring their hands about, oh, the stock market is down twenty or thirty percent, as it was during the COVID pandemic, for example, 
Yeah, it's it's painful for people that are already holding lots of stocks, but for people that are buying stocks, it, you're buying on sale. Mm -hmm. And the only time you really hope that the market goes up is when you're nearing the end of your saving period and you want to start using your money. And that's when you hope the markets are nice and high. So if you have a long time horizon and the ability to just contribute regularly, as I say, $100 a month, um, uh, it can really benefit you. And I actually have some some uh, mathematical examples that I can share with you if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's take, uh, you know, the first 10 years of the millennium, say from 2000 to 2009, that was a very bad time for the U.S. stock market. So during that time period, uh, U.S. stocks actually went down about a percent a year over over a period of 10 years. So that would not be the best time you would think to be invested in the stock market. However, if you, using my example of just putting in $100 a month, beginning in January of 1999, and you just did that for 25 years, $100 a month for 25 years, so January 99 to the end of December of 2023, the total value of your portfolio would be $120,000. $239. And that's with a total amount invested of 30,000. So your 30,000 became 120,000, which is an internal rate of return of about 9.8%. Now we know that the US stock market did not do 9.8% in the first 10 years of the millennium, they did negative 1% a year. Right. But by buying stocks during that time, and the subsequent bear markets, everyone remembers the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, by buying stocks all the way through that period as well, you did extremely well. And it didn't take a lot of, all it, all it took was the discipline to put $100 a month away every month. So it, it's it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I love messing around with the, the calculators and, and looking at things and talking about things like compound interest. Because talk a little bit about that, because... Most people who are in debt live in paycheck to paycheck. Interest to them is like, I'm paying it. Credit cards, car payments, student loans, whatever it might be. Not many people are actually earning interest. But can you talk briefly about what the magic is behind compound interest? And you mentioned time. Like, you know, you mentioned this example, you have 25 years. How does time and compound interest work together? Well, um, Listen, let me let me just uh, first of all talk about compound interest versus simple interest. Yep. So um so simple interest um is kind of like if you're paying off a loan and you're and the interest that you accrue, meaning you owe it, you have to pay your lender, uh, as long as you pay off the amount of interest each month, then that's what's called simple interest. So for example, uh you're now you're not paying interest anymore, as you say, which is a penalty. You're earning interest, which is a which is a benefit. Uh, simple interest, as an example, if the interest rate is five percent, uh, if you invest ten thousand dollars, you earn five percent per year. So you're in five hundred dollars per year, and after ten years, you would have five thousand dollars. So five hundred per year times times ten years. Okay, so that's simple interest. So, sorry, Greg, the total would be fifteen. 000. Oh, sorry, fifteen thousand would be your total <laughs> you didn't value. Lose five thousand. Yeah, you gained ten, five thousand. Yeah, ten thousand of of your own money and and five thousand of interest. So your value is fifteen thousand at the end of that ten year period. Compound interest just means essentially that every year you earn interest on your principal amount that you invested plus the interest that you earned the previous year. So uh, so if you're in five hundred dollars uh, one year, then the next year you earn five percent on your original ten thousand plus the five hundred of interest that you earned. So after ten years, instead of fifteen thousand dollars, you end up with sixteen thousand two hundred and eighty eight dollars. And so you've got now ten thousand of your original investment plus six thousand two hundred and eighty eight dollars of interest instead of five thousand. So, so that's basically 25% more interest just by virtue of having compound compounding working for you. And one last, one last example to try to um, tie together the, the power of compound interest really grows and multiplies over time. So the more time you have for interest to compound, uh, the better off you are. And so um, I'm gonna run some numbers and it's a little bit hard 
uh, you know, when you can't sit down and look at the numbers, uh, hearing them described can be a little challenging. So I'll do my best and, and reiterate the numbers. But let's say you've got two scenarios. Consider them twins. One twin begins saving $100 a month at age 25 and saves for 15 years. So for 15 years, uh, so from age 25 to age 40, um, they save $100 a month and earn 5% a year. After that 15 years of saving, they don't invest any further money. So from age 40 to age 65, they don't invest anymore. They've just got the money they've invested originally. You want to know why they don't invest anymore, Greg? Why? Because now they're paying for their kids. Exactly. <laughs> they got to pay for <laughs> birthdays and activities. That's right. Age they don't have that 100 bucks a month anymore. That's a tough age. So yeah. uh, they're expensive. Anyway, <laughs> at, at age 65, uh, they would have $90,889 based on an initial investment of 18000 100 a month over 15 years. Their twin decides to wait for 10 years. Uh, perhaps they have children earlier. <laughs> At any case, they begin saving at age 35 and save for 30 years. So starting at age 35, they save $100 a month right up until age 65 at the same 5% compounded. At age 65, they'll have 83500 So the first twin saved for 15 years, invested only 18000 and has 90, over $90,000, whereas by starting 10 years later, you have to invest twice as much, and instead of ninety thousand, you have eighty-three thousand. Yeah. So it just goes to show that the the power of compounding is really magnified the earlier you can begin. So, and and it's never too late, by the way. So in this particular example, it's great that somebody started at age twenty-five. Yeah. But if you're starting at age thirty-five, that's okay. But maybe you need to contribute one hundred and fifty dollars a month instead of a hundred. Yeah. I I. I took this example, I learned this, and for both of my kids, I put in just $75 a month, and I've been doing that since they were born. Yep. $75 a month, I invest it every single month. And uh, the amazingness that that will turn out to be one day for oh, them yes. and helping them. It's it's And it's just a little amount. We think about, you know, you know, you had brought up, you know, Colin, that it's kids, what well, we talked about, kids are expensive, right? They have all these costs and stuff. But think about how much junk we buy our kids that they don't even use anymore. And, you know, you think about 75 yeah. bucks. I mean, that's like the average cell phone plan for a lot of people, you know? So yep. even if you did $25, just, just how that'll grow over time and then teaching your kids to continue doing it, you know, and just to keep going, um, man, it could just do wonders for, you know, from generational wealth standpoint and changing your family tree and, and saving and all that stuff. So it's so cool. I love compound interest. It's always a fun topic. I, I think the, the add on to that is, is, as Greg was saying, just put in what you can and make it a regular habit. Yeah. So whether it's 25, 50, 100 or 500, whatever your cash flow situation is, you're going to be further ahead. Like there's nobody that starts a savings plan that 20 years later looks back and says, "Oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that." You know, but there's lots of people that are close to 65, 70 years old that look back and go, "Man, I wish I would have saved earlier." You right. know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I hear people that we help that are in their, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and they're saying the same thing. I wish I would have started when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, knowing what I know yeah. today. So right on. So guys, how do you combat all of the information that's going on out there, you know, with with your clients? You know, I mean, social media and the news and just the uncertainties that are happening in the world at all times. And now we've got our money in the market and fear strikes that we're going to lose it all. And how do you work with people through those emotions? Because, um, you know, consistency and discipline, obviously continuing to do it month after month, year after year is how you grow wealth over time. But how do you navigate some of these really, you know, these areas that we go through in life that are more of turmoil and, you know, the economy's up, the economy's down, there's war, there's inflation, there's, you know, there's all these things going on. How do we work through that? I think the easiest way of dealing with that is just to sh point out how everything is cyclical, that the headlines today are no different than the headlines from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There's always a reason to not invest. There's always, there's always something going on in the world. Today it's, you know, Israel and Gaza and Ukraine and uh, maybe an upcoming U.S. election, um, inflation, interest rates. Like there's, 
there's just, those are the headlines, right? What we do advise people do is to ignore the headlines. You know, so if you've, if you've established that regular saving plan, just to accept that there are headlines that are going to try to take you off the rails and you just have to ignore them. And that's, that's step one. And it's, I'm, I'm making it sound very simple, Greg. It's probably the hardest thing people have to deal with because we call them squirrel moments. Do you remember the, the movie? Was it up? I think it was called up kids movie. Anyways, yeah. with the balloons the, in the, the house. Yeah. 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 The, the guy's going through something and there's a squirrel moment and where he gets off track just for a second. I mean, that's kind of what headlines do to you. You know, I mean, the fact is every time, every day that the market has a negative day, you're going to see a big headline about yeah. how the Dow dropped this, the S&P 500 dropped that. Every day that the market goes up by the same amount, you're not going to see that headline that things are pretty good right now. Like it's never printed, right? Right. So the first thing you got to do is just ignore it. Just continue to keep saving uh, with your strategy and just accept that there are things that are going to try to take you off the track. Yeah, 9-11 comes to mind when you brought that up. I remember, you know, they they constantly talked about how the market went down after 9-11, but then when it rebounded, I think it was a month and a half later, there was no, no real mention of it, you know? <laughs> I mean, you really, you really have to... Um trust you have to trust the markets in a way you know the markets have been going up steadily since they were you know uh, since they were formed since 1926 there's been the great depression there's been a world war there's been 911 as you mentioned there's there's been all sorts of global and geopolitical and uh, issues and and once in a lifetime things like pandemics and yet the markets continue to go up over time and it's to be expected because uh, because the economies grow, you know, and and businesses grow, and so, so I think uh, part of it is really believing, you know, and it's because you're fighting emotions, and so it's a very difficult thing. But the best way to fight emotions is is with facts and discipline, and say, you know what, uh, this has happened before. The markets have never gone to zero, and there's no reason why they would go to zero. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, thank goodness I'm buying stocks every month because they're on sale right now. And I'm, I'm going to be really happy about that in the future sometime. Mm -hmm. So you really have to visualize the future with the belief that things will be better at some point in the future. Yeah. You know, uh, that actually reminds me of a question we've been getting a lot these days. We're in Canada, but of course our market is influenced by the U S market greatly. And um, a question we get a lot is, uh, with this upcoming U.S. election, I'm not going to turn this into a political discussion by any means, but, you know, should I be worried about the markets and putting money in? And some of the work Greg and I have done, we've looked back at all kinds of previous presidential cycles, and the reality is the market doesn't really care if it's a, if the person's wearing a blue hat or a red hat that's sitting in the White House. It is agnostic. So the what the market does care about are there are global macro events that will impact it in the short term, but it doesn't matter who the president is. And I'd, I'm sure there are people listening here that might take offense to that or, or maybe <laughs> maybe won't agree with that statement. But if you just look back, uh, one of the worst performing presidential cycles was George W. Bush. Now, you'd say, well, why was that? Was it because of the leader? No, it was because when he was president, you had... 9-11, the global tech wreck, global financial crisis, and then he was out of the White House. And then you had Obama come in, and we had the longest bull market in U.S. stock market history, which had nothing to do with Obama. It's just that's the way the cycle went, you know? And so our advice to people when they ask that question is, it just doesn't matter. You know, the market might react very uh, quickly, very short, in a very short period of time. But you're not invested for a day, a week, or a month. You're invested for, you know, years and decades. So is there a way to um, to stay informed in a healthy way that doesn't cause a lot of this fear? Because obviously, you know, news mm. is just the easiest place to go. Social media is the easiest place to go because it's right there. You're always there. Uh, I mean, what do you guys recommend to your clients to stay informed? In? Like, or Or do you suggest, you know, just set it and try to forget it. Just leave it alone. You know, check it every once in a while, or or what do you guys recommend in that situation? Yeah, I, I think uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't say check it and forget it, but certainly to not focus on the short term. 
because um, because there's a lot of what we call noise in the markets. Markets can fluctuate quite a bit from day to day without being meaningful. You know, it's just it's just noise. Uh, I equate it to myself, who I've been on a you know a perpetual uh, weight loss plan, and uh, and you know when you're uh, when you're watching your weight every day, you can go up by half a pound or down by half a pound, and it's really not it's really not important. It's a longer term trend. And so what we recommend is that people take time to establish the right investment strategy, ideally consistent with some long term plan or goal that's been established at the beginning of their uh, investing uh, journey. And, and then check in regularly to say, are we on track? And if we're not on track, why are we not on track? And maybe it's been a, a bad cycle in the market. Um, maybe it's been, uh, you know, spending plans that don't line up with, uh, with income, you know, and so it does tie closely to what we hope that people will do. And that is find an advisor or find a way to establish some plans and some goals up front, and then just measure your progress against those goals. Because a lot of times, if you're working towards a goal, even if the market didn't behave the way you would have liked in the last three or six months, you might still well be on track to achieve your goals. And therefore, it's it's not that it's not important, but you can look beyond it and say, okay, this will improve over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, oh, Greg, you mentioned uh, advisor. So hiring an advisor, looking for an advisor, or considering doing it on my own, like what, what are the options for people to start looking at investing and what do you guys uh, recommend? Well, there's <clears throat> various, there are various ways to invest, you know, and, and so from the, from the very simplest um, online robo advisor kind of, you know, a uh, kind of scenario where uh, using an online platform, you can get access to some introductory um, investment advice. Uh, in many cases, uh, it will be very appropriate advice because many of the platforms recommend, you know, a broadly diversified portfolios uh, using exchange traded funds or or some low cost uh, investment like that. Um, it, but it does take that the kind of person that would use a robo advisor would be one who's confident in themselves, you know, to be able to work their way through, understand what's being presented to them. Uh, so that's the, uh, that, that's the uh, sort of self, self-help route, uh, all the way to looking at an advisor at an investment firm, like uh, I registered an RIA uh, in, in the U.S., registered investment advisors, or, or through one of the large uh, broker-dealer uh, type of uh, firms, but looking for some advice, um, uh, and those people might, you know, uh, where certainly you want you want somebody that's you know, has the credentials and the experience to be able to advise you and is willing to work with you, depending on on your investments, you know, uh, uh, investment portfolio or how much cash you have to invest. Um, and there are also uh, financial planners that may help. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, there is no right answer for everybody because yeah. there are a number of different routes, but I think you have to uh, consider your own strengths and weaknesses in, in terms of being able to do your own research uh, from the standpoint of how to get started uh, and certainly use an advisor wherever possible, uh, assuming a reasonable cost to do so uh, and to get some professional advice. Yeah. You know, Brad, I want to add to that. I, I think it's kind of like um, medical advice. You know, I might have some issue with, I don't know, my knee is sore and I'm going to go to Google and say, my knee is sore and it's going to give me all kinds of different things to look at. And it yeah. usually comes down to, I'm having a heart attack or I have cancer <laughs> yeah. is typically it's the, the, the direction. It, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I probably am not having a heart attack. Maybe I just sprained my knee. You know, when we work with people and whether they're coming from a bank or they're coming from another advisor or they just have been doing it on their own. The first thing we ask them is, do you have a financial plan? You know, where you've established those goals, those buckets that you want to accomplish. The second thing that comes out of that is how much risk is appropriate for you, you know? And there's all kinds of online tools that will tell you, um, it will direct you to what your proper, what's called asset allocation should be. So just how much should be in things that have low risk and how much should be in things that have more like stock market risk. The third thing is we say is, just make sure you're really diversified. So you don't own 
one thing you own hundreds of things. And that, as Greg said, could be done through a mutual fund or exchange traded fund. And that none of that requires working with an advisor. You could do all that work by yourself. Uh, but if you have somebody that you found that you trust, they might be able to help you a little bit more. The, la the, the last two things are, number four is, what are your fees and expenses? Like, how much are you paying for that advice? You know, because that's really important. Like, it's what they call the silent killers. You know, how much tax am I paying because of that advice? How What are my investment advisory fees? And then the last one, which is actually the most important one, is managing your emotion. And that is avoiding the headlines and all that stuff, just staying invested. So that's kind of the, the five-step breakdown that we use with everybody, whether they're new to investing or they're somebody that we've been working with a long time. Yeah, that's great. So when it comes to like hiring an investor though, are there are there any warning signs of stay away from like a, an investment advisor, stay away from that? Yeah. You know, I got I, one for for sure. Like yeah. anybody that's that starts the conversation with product, just walk away. You know, it it there's there's got to be like you can't you can't put the cart before the horse. You got to come up with the plan, not the yeah. end uh, product. Greg, you got any others? Well, and for me, and and um, because advisors can work in a variety of different ways and they get paid in a vari variety of different ways, but we generally would say, you know, um, getting charged commissions for transactions can, can set up a very, you know, risky a scenario in terms of possible conflicts of interest and things like that. Why is somebody recommending a trade which will generate a a commission uh, right. is that really in my best interest? And so uh, we believe that um, that other you know other ways of of paying for advice, uh, if you have to pay for advice, like if you're using an advisor, uh, you know that uh, that maybe would be more related to uh, fees for the assets that they're managing or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, absolutely. But as Colin says, the most important thing is is how can somebody make a recommendation for me when they don't when they don't know me and the way to get to know uh, an investor is by digging into their situation and, and developing a financial plan for them. So you mentioned fees, well, like what, I mean, what, what, what does it cost? I mean, cause obviously it costs money to invest. Like where, where are people, where are those costs hmm. located for people so they can kind of get an idea of what they're going to pay for things like these? I, I think the a big misconception is that when they, let's say somebody goes to a, their local bank, and they buy a term deposit or they buy a bank sponsored mutual fund, the person might feel like they're not paying any fees. And this just isn't true. I mean, the bank is not a charity, right? right. It, it has walls. It has uh, an HVAC system. It has employees to pay, you know? So if you buy a term deposit, you might not see the fee being charged, but instead of saying the, that term deposit paying you 5%, it's paying you 4.75% and the bank is keeping that, that 0.25. That's the fee, right? And the same thing happens in mutual funds. So if you buy a, a bank owned mutual fund, there's something called a managed expense ratio, which is the cost of the fund. You know, it's the cost to, for the provider to manage that investment solution. It's typically uh, buried, you know, it's, it's not always upfront, you know? And so, you won't see that it's maybe costing you 2% per year to have that fund managed. You know, so in other words, if that investment makes 8% a year, but it's got a 2% management fee, well, the net to you is 6%, right? Right, right. So those are sort of typical ones. And then as Greg mentioned, uh, another issue is that um, it's, it's not so relevant in the States, I think, Greg. It's more in Canada right now. Because in the States, you can do sort of commission-free trading platforms. Sure. Um, we don't have that here, uh, but even the commission-free trading platforms, there are still fees being collected behind the scenes. Like those platforms don't exist again because they're charities. They're not run by the Red Cross. Like they're run by people that have a vested interest in in having them, uh, you know, attract more dollars. So there's there's fees and commissions being paid behind the scenes that people just might not be aware of. I, I think, uh, and I think if you're looking for a number to put in, uh, in your listeners' minds, Brad, you know, if you think of something in the 1% range, that would be a, a very typical fee or a cost for managing a portfolio 
regardless of of whether you know whether you're buying mutual funds or buying exchange traded funds or with with the with advice you know i think uh, i think 1% is a is a number it might some some firms might charge a little more uh maybe some charge a little less but that would be a number that uh, that people could keep in their in their minds mm -hmm. as a guidepost well, guys, this has been absolutely fantastic, especially just, you know, as an introduction to some of these topics when it comes to investing. If people want to listen to more of what you guys have to offer, uh, where can they find more information from you guys? Sure. Our podcast is called CM, as in Charlie Mother, CM Group, Free Lunch. It's available on every one of the the places you would find your podcast, or you can check us out at uh, www.markets-work.com. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for being here today and uh, dropping you. some wisdom on all of us. I appreciate you guys. So, hey, if you want to pay off debt, save more money and take control of your finances and start seeing some amazing results here in just the next 30 to 60 days, all you have to do is head over to DebtFreeDead.com, click on the green button at the top of the page, and we're going to show you how you can get started on your own financial journey.